Uh, so I can like talk for hours. About this. <laughs> um, I have like 30 minutes. It's, I don't want to even get warmed up. So, um, but I'm going to try to do my talk in about 15 minutes, and then have the rest of the time for questions because um, then hopefully I'll tell you the stuff that you're really interested in. Um, so I did put together a few. Uh, Slides here. Um, I work for the Oregon Water Resources Department. I worked for them for 30 years. I've been in this job 17 years. Uh, the water master is uh, enforced water law. Now, water law having to do with people taking control of it and putting it to some use. Not in, almost nothing related to water quality, except we also regulate the well construction industry. So we try to make sure wells are constructed. So by virtue of their construction, they're not contaminating the groundwater resource. But otherwise, nothing about water quality. A uh, set of water use disputes about people arguing about uh, what is left in places where there's not a lot. Monitor stream flows. Um, there are three places that I go to throughout the year, about every five weeks, and uh, measure the stream flow down with some of the reporters and change batteries and stuff. And in the summertime, there's uh, another eight or ten places that I go and try to get uh, measurements uh, related to um, regulation. Um, we monitor stream flows uh, mostly to protect in-stream water rights um, and uh, to get data for planning. Those three places where I collect data throughout the year, uh, it's not really a regulatory site. We're just getting long-term um, kind of background natural flow information from stations. Uh, enforce well construction standards. Uh, right now, um, so I, there, there are 20 water masters around the state, um, and we have the state divided into five regions, so there's, there's five water masters in the northwest region. We have two positions that do well construction inspections. Um, right now we have somebody in one of those positions, uh, and for years we didn't have anybody in those positions. And I used to do a lot of well construction inspection. Uh, when we had nobody in that, that job. But, so in the Northwest region, we have one person who, who looks at uh, his full-time job is looking at wells. I spend a lot of time talking to the public on the phone about where water rights are, where they're not, uh, if they can get them, why they can't get them, um, and uh, helping people find well construction reports. We've uh, maintained well construction records since 1955. But uh, many times those old records had very poor information about where exactly the well is. Um, but they always had a landowner's name. And as time's gone on, they've gotten better information about where the well is. Uh, and nowadays, when somebody has a new well constructed, they have to, uh, within a month, give us a map that shows us where the well is on the property. But for many old wells, we, uh, we have pretty scant information, so it's kind of a treasure hunt. I left a couple pamphlets back there. One of them has to do with water rights, and another one has to do with uh, uh, a landowner's uh, handbook for well ownership. Um, uh, I help people when, we, when they can get a water right. Uh, I often spend a lot of time helping them prepare the application or prepare the, uh, the application map. Um, the map requires stuff that's not particularly hard to do, but if you only do it once or twice in your life, uh, we ask for things that you don't know what we're talking about. And it kind of saves time often for me to do it in the first place than for them to send it in and then it gets sent back and they say, go talk to the water master for your help. And, and so I end up usually helping them anyway. Water right research, well, uh, log research, dam safety inspections. Any dam that's over 10 feet tall and stores more than 3 million gallons of water, we look at on a one to six year basis, depending on the rating of it being a high hazard or a no hazard kind of a, a dam. The no low hazards we look at every six years and high hazards. We try to look at it every year, um, but we don't look at big federal projects. They've got their own uh, engineers that are more qualified than, than me to look at them. Um, so, water rights. Um, the Oregon Water Code's uh, been around since 1909. Originally, it just dealt with surface water. For up until 1955, we didn't care about groundwater. We either thought there was either so little of it that people weren't going to argue about it, or there was so much of it people weren't going to argue about it. But we didn't regulate groundwater until 1955. But since 1909, anybody making a new use of surface water is supposed to first get a permit from us, file an application. We look at it, think, can we issue this? That will harm. The public interest will harm another water right. 
Um, and now it's a, a fairly complicated analysis, but uh, we have administrative rules that say what new uses will allow in different places. And we do, uh, for surface water, um, a pretty sophisticated water availability analysis, saying can we issue this right without impacting another, uh, another water right. So uh, since 1909, first you file an application. If everything looks good on the application, we issue you a permit. The permit typically says you've got five years to put in your system and then one, and use that, put that water to beneficial use, and one more year to give us proof that you did that. Uh, that proof, when I was originally hired, I was hired to do what was called final proof surveys back in 1985, where the agency used to send people out to see, well, they got a permit for 30 acres to irrigate, are they irrigating 25, are they irrigating 35? We'd make a map that would say where those, those acres were on the ground. We issue a water right certificate, that certificate and that map attach that water to that ground, essentially forever. Um, although the landowner can always cancel it, and it is possible for the landowner to transfer it, to pick it up and move it someplace else, or pick it up and move it someplace else and change the character of use, but there's a formal administrative process to do that. If that doesn't happen, the water right sits on the ground forever. So a common question is, I'm telling you to hold your questions, and it makes me think of some things that people typically ask me here is, um, a lot of people are aware of this use it or lose it uh, phrase and, and statute, and there's a statute that's pretty clear. Uh, the statute really clearly says if you don't use a water right for five years in a row, you have abandoned the right and it's forfeited. So that sounds pretty clear. I mean, you don't use it, it's not there anymore. But uh, eventually, I'll show you a map in my district. I cover a very, very large area, and uh, people ask me, are there water rights on a piece of ground? And I can look in my records and see, well, uh, yeah, there's a reissue the right there, but I don't know if it hasn't been used for five years in a row. And there's a, if somebody doesn't use it for five years and they start using it again, and, and 15 years goes by, there's a 15-year statute of limitations on somebody raising that that claim and that it wasn't used for five years in, in starting the cancellation process. But um, I don't often know when something's been used or not. And so I can say there's a valid right of record, but I can't say it's a valid right because I don't necessarily know that it didn't go five years in that use at some point. And it's even much worse than that. Um, uh, if there's a valid right of record, a person can put a pump in, start irrigating that ground, it's an irrigation right or use the water for whatever the right's for. And if somebody comes to me and says, they didn't use that for 15 years, go shut them up. That right's been forfeited. I give them an affidavit. If they fill out an affidavit that says they're willing to testify that they have first-hand knowledge of five years of non-use and how they have that five years of that knowledge of five years of non-use, and they get somebody else to fill out another one, we get two of those things, we'll start a cancellation process. Or we go to that landowner and say, well, it looks like you got some evidence you didn't use this. And if, uh, if they are say, yeah, I didn't, we'll cancel their right. We'll give them something that says we're going to cancel it in 60 days unless they ask for a hearing. If they ask for a hearing, we try to work it out some resolution without going to a hearing because we spend a bunch of money on, on hearings. Um, if we have to, we hold a little mini trial to see who's got evidence of use or non-use. We cancel it or we don't. 15 years, 17 years I've been in this job, and we haven't canceled one right in my district under that. The statute. Um, it used to be if I knew something that wasn't used for five years that I could start a cancellation process, but the statutes were changed to make it more difficult. I now have to send somebody a letter every year for five years in a row that says I saw you use it this year, this year, this year. When I first started doing this, I started that process and my boss told me, don't do that because Somebody will get a letter for four years in a row, and then they'll hire somebody to come clear their ground, plant it, and irrigate it. And then for that year, there's less water in the stream because people who weren't using the water are now using it. And you know, by trying to cancel the rights, we're actually making potentially people use water that otherwise they, they wouldn't. So um, uh, I have a problem of going off on tangents <laughs> easily. Permits, go to certificates. Certificates are essentially around forever. The landowner can, if somebody wants to transfer a right, they'll pick it up and move it someplace else. They have to give us some kind of proof that they've actually used it in that spot within the last five years, or we won't allow it to be transferred. And we may then start a cancellation process that comes to our attention that they are going to try to eliminate.
resurrect someday. Um, who needs water right? Uh, anybody who's going to, for surface water, take water out of any surface water source. You're going to take control of the public waters of the state, put it to a beneficial use. Uh, control, public waters, and beneficial use. So those are the three tests. So public waters, basically everything's public waters. Um, what's not, you don't need a water right to uh, collect rainwater off an artificial surface and do anything you want to with it. Store it. Mm. Save it, use it. You don't need water. If it falls on an artificial surface and you collect it off the roof or a parking lot, something like that. But if you have water running down your hillside and you say, oh, I should, I'd be great if I could save that, and you dig a hole and you take the dirt from that hole and you pile it up on the downstream side, now you've got a pond, and that water used, would have run off your property, you need a right to store that water. And with, generally, we still issue water rights to store water in the wintertime. And then we take another permit if you want to, if you just want to store it because you want to swim in it, you want to have it in case there's a fire, you want to put fish in it or something like that, it just takes the permit to store that water. But if you want to then store that water and use it to irrigate something with, it takes a diff different, another permit, one to store it, one to use it. Um, there's very few things you can do with surface water that you don't need a permit for. Livestock watering, if you have a place where your livestock can go down to a creek and you don't want them to go down to the creek and you don't want them to go down to the creek, you can somehow divert that water out of the creek into a stock tank. And if the stock tank has either an automatic shutoff so it fills up, stops taking water out, or you know, an enclosed overflow delivery system, so a hole in the top of the tank with a, with a hose on it that carries the overflow back to the same stream, you don't need a, a water right for the livestock in that situation. Uh, step projects, salmon trout enhancement programs don't need water rights, but they have to be bona fide step projects. People say, well, this is the benefit to fish. And they say, well, you, know, you have step endorsement. If they don't, it doesn't count. Um, groundwater, there are, since in 1955, we said new uses of groundwater, you need a permit for everything except, and then we said a whole bunch of things. <laughs> so you don't need it. And everything I say, there's an exception to everything. <laughs> so, uh, groundwater, you don't need a permit for domestic use, um, livestock use, watering up to one half acre of non commercial lawn and garden. Um, in any case, if there's an actual fire burning someplace, you can, of course, use any water that you can get your hands on. Um, uh, commercial or industrial use of groundwater in quantities of up to 5,000 gallons a day. Essentially, any other use of groundwater can be uh, a permit for. Um, permit process you file an application, it takes about eight months before we issue a permit. It's supposed to take about six, but we stretch it out to eight. There's two opportunities for public uh, comment, public involvement. People give us comments on a proposal and give the opportunity for them to protest something. Um, the use has to be allowable in the basin program, set of administrative rules. This, the, Mid-Coast Basin Program, which the site saw is in the Mid-Coast Basin Program, uh, hasn't been updated in a really long time. So that Basin Program essentially allows everything everywhere. But then we do this water availability analysis to say, um, are all the, how, much, how much flow do we think is naturally available in a particular stream? We, we do this statistical analysis to say, what do we think is naturally available each month of the year in every place where we have an in-stream water right or where we have some uh, gauging um, record. And we estimate what is naturally possible on, on uh, average, uh, not really average, of 50% exceeds. Then we estimate what's naturally possible in a dry year. What's going to be the quantity that's going to be exceeded 8 out of 10 years. So we call it 80% exceeds uh, flow. From that number, we subtract what are, uh, we subtract any use that we think is taking place, so then you get what we think is really remaining there, at least eight out of ten years. And from that, we subtract an in-stream water right, if there is one. And then we say, is there any water left over? And if there is, we could issue this water available for new use. Um, in Lake Creek, in the Sayus Law, as, as you come up the Sayus Law, there's water available in the lower part of the Sayus Law uh, essentially 11 months a year. It's just October that the in-stream water is not met down there for about two weeks, statistically. 
Um, when you get to uh, Lake Creek, uh, water is available, I, I believe, until June. So if somebody wanted a permit where they could you know, irrigate until June, they could probably get it. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and anymore, we used to actually issue permits for these short periods of time, and then people would be irrigating in July and September, and um, say, well, why are they doing it? And they go, oh, I've got a water right. And then, you know, show it to me. And they say, I mean, you know, read that paragraph. And well, what are you issue me this far? <laughs> so, anymore, we don't issue permits unless the water is available for a full season, unless people can really justify how they're going to get some benefit from a very short um, opportunity to hear uh, That's a map of my district. It's generally Lynn and Lane counties. There's a little bit of Lynn County I don't have. There's a little bit of Lane County I don't have. There's a little bit of uh, Benton County that I do have. It's kind of a geographical, historical, political um, boundary. It kind of makes sense. It's, you know, not, not perfect sense, though. Um, so, I'm the one person that covers this. I do sometimes, right now, I have an intern from LCC who's working two days a week for me. Um, I do also share an assistant water master with the five other water masters, um, and she works out of Salem. And, about three weeks ago, she started coming down here one day a week. So um, I'm not completely by myself. Uh, talking about stream flows around here. So this is uh, from the USGS website that shows what the flows are on the side saw. And this is from sometime this morning. Um, so it was 49 cubic feet per second uh, when I looked at this. Probably about 10.30 or 11 o'clock. Well, let's see. 11 o'clock uh, when, when this is, is taken. The um, median is 132 for this time. Um, so this min here is 71. That's not really a good number. That's a, a minimum monthly average, not the uh, minimum daily flow. Um, the median is 132. The mean is 166. Uh, the max is 900, and that will be exceeded. I'll show you that. Um, this is, uh, we used to have a, I don't know, this, this is from uh, historic records for, for the gauge, uh, for the same gauge, we published this back in uh, 87 or something like that. Unfortunately, I didn't, it's not very good. But um, it says over here, <coughs> extremes for the period, uh, Somewhere, I've got 45 cubic feet per second, August 18th or 19th, 1977. So today it was at 49, and the historic low was 45. Um, that was in 1977. Ever. Ever, right. And then you lose those the records. Yeah, so we're pretty pretty close to the historic uh, um, low. Now that, one of the things <coughs> I didn't check was um, that site's a USGS site. And they generally are only coming out and getting another measurement about every three months. So this is based on kind of the most recent curve that they have. I don't know when their last measurement was. I don't know how, how precise that is. But um, it's, it's you know, pretty darn close to what the historic uh, uh, record uh, has ever been. So you know, how are things doing? They're, they're, they're ex you know, we're, we're, we're a record setting. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, so uh, when I do a stream flow measurement, this is uh, Lake Creek, you probably, some of you know where that place is, and that was an intern a few years ago, that's a thing called the flow tracker I meant to bring uh, one with me, but I didn't. Um, anyway, I do a stretch of tape across the stream, um, I get try 26 uh, velocity measurements, separate velocity measurements, where you take a measurement for 40 seconds at each place, at, 40, at each place you actually get 40 measurements and it averages the velocity. Um, and, uh, and, and you're, you're applying that velocity to a width halfway back to the last one, halfway back. So you get a, a width and a depth, and, and you apply a velocity through there, and you get 26 of those separate little cells, and you add them all up, and you get the total discharge from the station. And that thing makes these really, really cool uh, graphs. Um, this thing here is saying what, what the depth is as you run across each one of those little diamonds is the place where we uh, got a velocity measurement. Uh, this is the thing saying, well, what uh, is the velocity as it's uh, at 
at each one of those. And this is to show what percentage of the total discharge you measured at each one of those cells. So when they're wider apart uh, and it's deeper water, um, and it's faster water, you're measuring a higher percentage of, uh, of the total. And the goal is to have all those uh, separate cells be under 5% of the total. Those over 5% it turns yellow, those over 10%. You can't do that in February. Oh, you can't wait, no. I mean. no. So uh, I thought about putting the other side of what, what I do in the wintertime. Um, and for myself, I have to either measure off a bridge or um, I. Uh, I have one place where we have a manned cable car, but they don't let us use it anymore. Another place we have a, an unmanned cable way where you essentially crank this thing out and it has a carriage that goes out and a cable that goes out to the, a pulley and down to a 50 pound weight and you set a, a velocity meter on top of that and, um, and you, still, you still get 26 <coughs> measurements of flow or more. Um, so uh, doing regulation, uh, the classic sense um, is a farmer's out of water and he calls me up and I, I go out and see if there's anybody upstream from him who's using water without a water right. And uh, if nobody is, then I look for uh, somebody upstream from him who has a more recently issued water right to shut that new one off in favor of the old one. Uh, that's called the prior appropriation doctrine. It's uh, what's generally used in water law west of the Mississippi. Um, it was a doctrine that really encouraged, promoted settlement to the West. So people came out and put an investment into, into some property, an investment that had to do with using water. They didn't have some confidence that they'd be able to use that in the future. Um, so that's what this is uh, supposed to show, is that there's somebody with a 1910 water right here, and they're not getting what they're entitled to. I could go and shut off somebody uh, with a 1970 water right to get them water upstream. I do very little of that. Almost all the regulation that I do is to protect in-stream water rights. Um, the perspective used to be that any water that went to the ocean was wasted because it, we let it slip through our fingers without doing something valuable with it. Um, eventually, we started recognizing that uh, now we should, if there's some value in having water. <laughs> streams have, uh, have water in them, and rivers have water in them. 1955, the legislature told us to uh, gave our, what was then the Water Resources Commission, they were the Water Policy Review Board, the ability to adopt those basin programs and in them set rules that said we want this much water in this stream this time of the year. Um, those were administrative rules, they were called minimum perennial stream flows, uh, 1975 or something like that, someplace in the John Day Basin, we were going to have to shut off a bunch of people in the, in the, I think it was 77, so that was a really dry year. Um, Anyway, they, they rescinded some for a couple of years, for a year, and uh, that upset a lot of people, and it got a, the statutes changed, and we were directed to take all those things and issue in water rights certificates for them. Theoretically, that made some harder for us to ignore, and created a process for ODFWDQ and Parks and Rec to apply for new ones, and created a process for somebody who has an existing water right can transfer it to a mainstream water right with the same priority date that their, that their own right has. Also, if somebody lease it in stream, do uh, a temporary five year in stream lease where that water gets protected in stream and uh, it resets that forfeiture clock um, also. Uh, so, most of my regulation is for that. And I shut people off in Lake Creek virtually every year for a 1964 in stream water right. Um, these maps that I've got on the walls here, there's two over there and two over there. Uh, the dark green areas are places with water rights that are older than 1964. The light green are places with water rights that are junior to 1964 that get shut off in, in favor of that. It doesn't mean, so the in-stream water rights were 50 cubic feet per second. It doesn't mean there's going to be 50 cubic feet per second there because I can shut everybody off and it might still be less than 50 cubic feet per second. People with older water rights are immune to it, um, but people that are after 64, they typically get shut off every year. Um, similarly, that happens in the Calapuya Basin, uh, I'm sorry, here it's 1966, in the Calapuya it's 1964. Um, um, a few other places, Thomas Creek, Crabtree Creek, uh, the Mohawk gets shut off about every five years, um, and it's all generally for in-stream water rights. I, I mean, people do call me and say a lot of water, I think it's my name's fault, I still get, I mean, I, I do a little bit of that, but that's not a big part. 
when I uh, typically I shut somebody off now by sending them a postcard and then coming back and seeing if they're off. And if they're not off, then I'll go and shut off the pump and put this sign on that says, I came here and shut it off for you. <laughs> And if they turn back on again, then uh, I send them a notice of violation um, that says, now I'm really serious about this. And uh, if they turn back on again, every, every time I catch them using water every day after that is uh, the first day. It depends on the situation. If there's an in-stream water at that summit, the first day is $500. The second day is $1,000. The third day is $1,500. Um, and those are additive. So after three days, you're at $3,000. Um, 17 years, I've only find people twice. Uh, so it doesn't happen very much. Typically, a notice of violation. I've had people say, I've got attorneys lined up to fight you. Or, you know, <laughs> There's no way you're going to say, OK. I give up to me. But I never do. They take it to their attorney, and then they say, oh, you better stop putting these more. <laughs> so, um, a uh, question people often talk about or say or bring up. I mean, when I drive a, I, I said earlier, any any surface water use, you need a permit for. Um, people say, what about domestic use? Well, you need a permit for that. They say, well, what about a spring? Springs are kind of weird animals um, because the statute that references springs was written back when we didn't regulate groundwater. So what the springs uh, deal is, if a spring comes up on your property and under natural circumstances doesn't flow off of your property in a well-defined channel, but either sinks back into the ground or where it leaves your property, it's a big amorphous swamp. If, if you can collect that water before it leaves your property or sinks back into the ground, you can use it without a water right. But if, um, and I, get, I go out and look at things every year because people are buying property or they want to develop something, and the county wants evidence that there's a valid uh, use, and they're using water in the spring. If, um, if, in, if I look at it in, in August and say, well, it's not leaving the property yet, but it might, I'll say, well, this is what I see now, and I'll make an appointment to come back in February or March and see what is going on with it then, if it looks like it might possibly flow off the property in a well-defined channel. Um, and they say, well, I don't have any other source. Um, and we're not going to issue a water right from a stream. We can issue a right from a stream for human consumption for a year-round use if there's no reasonable alternative. No reasonable alternative means why can't you drill a well? And that typically means they tried to drill a well, or their neighbor tried to drill a well and went 300 feet and didn't find any water. Um, then they'll say, okay, we will issue you a permit for human consumption. But the statutes also uh, for groundwater, as I said earlier, you don't need a permit to use groundwater for domestic use, livestock use, up to a half acre lawn and garden. And the statutory definition of groundwater is any water below the land surface, including water below the beds and banks of rivers and streams. So this is a, an example of a hand dug shallow groundwater source. And if they put a pump in there, or in this case they have a pipe that goes through here and below the ground and comes out in some place that pipe daylights and they take that to the settling tank and it goes from the tank to their house. That's, an ex that's a legal use of groundwater for domestic use. Um, so and that's like the best one that I've ever seen. Some of them are really pretty nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I think that's my last slide. Um, Perfect I'll time. say no, I'm good at time. Perfect time. Good, yeah. Yeah. Right on with what? I did, oh, was that 15 or 30 minutes? I have no idea. No, you're at 7 on 7. Oh, it's 30 minutes. minutes on, on. Okay, a couple minutes for questions. We'll go, we'll go this way. Uh, I'm looking at a water right for shared domestic use. Mm -hmm. And under that right, the uh, city has the process, I guess, for approving an additional point of diversion. Uh, uh, the opportunity to put another pump in to pump water somewhere else. Am, is that correct? Well, you lost me. Um, is, what's the source? Oh. And maybe we should talk about it. Okay. Because, uh, I think it's something that will take a little while. Yeah. Okay. Um, last time that you were here, which was maybe 10 years ago, you talked about 
the time prior to when fish had water rights and when fish got water rights and when they, can you well, refresh I, my memory? Yeah, there? I mean, what I, I'm not sure what I said there, but what I'm what I, what, what I hearing you saying makes me think of is, <laughs> um, prior to 1955, when we didn't have any in-stream water rights at all. And, um, and in, in 1955, when the legislature told the Water Policy Review Board to go and set a bunch of minimum printed stream flows on a number of streams around the state. And so this one here in 1964, they just got to Lake Creek in 1966. Similarly, another thing I was going to mention, um, there's an in-stream water right on the science law. There's actually, I have a, a book, there's like 28, over 28 in-stream water rights throughout the science law basin. Say this much water at this point at every, at, at, throughout the year um, for fish life, they all have priority dates. And I can only sh enforce those against people who have water rights that come after them. So, uh, and I think there are in that book 28 separate in stream water rights, but many of them, there's, all, there's 13 of them at 13 different places. Some places have three in-stream water rights at the same spot. One was set in 1966 at some amount, and in 1974 they said, we set that too low, we should set that higher. So they set another one at the exact same spot for higher flows. But that, that later one is only effective against people who come after 1974. And then later on they said, we set that too low, we should set that higher. And they set another one in 1991. And that one's only effective against people who so anyway, there are people, the, the 1966 in-stream water right on the science law, I've never enforced against before, because that thing has always been met. And it's just screaming me now, hey, that one's not met either. Um, so there's probably people to shut off that have never been shut off before. There's not a lot of uses, but there are uses somewhere that, uh, that we'll get a visit in the postcard. Is there somebody for Nancy? Um, so, if you have if you have an in-stream used for 10 or 15 acres and you'd really just like to have a one acre garden and you'd like to give it to the fish, how hard is that? It's really easy. Um, it's really easy to do uh, temporary. Yeah, yeah. You can you can you can transfer those, those nine acres in stream for a five year period, uh, a temporary period, and, and renew it every five years, or you can do it on a permanent. I mean, it's the kind of thing that I would help you with. Um, it would take a couple hours, an hour and a half in my office. <laughs> yep. Uh, so wait, Steve was... Is, is that five years the minimum? No, that's the maximum for a temporary uh, in-stream lease. You can do it one year in, uh, uh -huh. in stream Yes. I have a question about rain barrels. I know in some states there's people been prosecuted for collecting rain on their own property. Mm -hmm. Primarily it was uh, Colorado mm -hmm. and when uh, those people were prosecuted for that um, and that was about 1997 or 6 or some, some time like that and Oregon statutes were silent on what the question and the next Next legislative session, they passed a bill that clearly says rainwater that falls on an artificial uh, impervious surface is private property. If a, until it reaches the natural ground, it uh, belongs to whoever owns that property. But once it you know, falls on your pasture um, and flows into a creek or flows you know, down your hillside, it's not an artificial impervious surface unless you cover your yard with this week. <laughs> Um, now in California, people are really upset because they've got legacy, you know, they've got legacy water rights, and the state is still taking their water away, and of course that's ending up in the courts. In this state, I don't know, maybe it's academic, but um, is there any way to restrict legacy or senior water rights in favor of some other public use? Currently no. No. Uh, the only thing I can think of people talk about um, uh, the uh, EP, the NIMS, National Marine Fisheries Service, potentially could uh, relate it to an endangered species. But 
back when the salmon were listed in Oregon, Oregon put together their own recovery plan that NIMS bought off on. And so long as NIMS thinks that some recovery is taking place, they're not going to step in because they don't really want to either. Um, uh, so under the Oregon plan, you know, potentially that could happen if, uh, if NIMS says, you know, Oregon, you're just not doing it. Yes, over here. Okay. You have time. Um, what are your thoughts on you know? There's this whole brew ha ha about Nestle buying rights um, cheap up to the north there. Yeah. What's your take on that or your understanding of that? Well, story? I probably shouldn't say it, but I will. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I I don't really care. Um, I don't you know I don't believe in bottled water. As a, as you know, a, a commodity, just because I think it's stupid, mm -hmm. but um, uh, and you know for that reason, and you know the pollution aspect of you know more plastic bottles and, and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it's it's to me, it's not a heck of a lot different from um, Nimkasi opening another plant someplace and, and bottling, you know, because that beer takes mm -hmm. a lot of water too. And it's, sure. I mean, although I'm in favor of you know. Anyway, um, it's, it's very, you know, from, from a water right standpoint, um, that's a, it's kind of a wash, I think, because right now that water is all being used in a fish hatchery, um, and, you know, it's probably better for the fish, I imagine, and, you know, that it's, uh, unless it gets that water, they can call it pure spring water, you know, it's a more marketable thing. The fish get water gets replaced by water that comes from whatever that cascade box. I don't know where their water is coming from, wells or something like that. But it, you know, there's no. It's all. Re, it's all. It's just kind of a little shell game to move it around so that Nestle can say, well, we're getting this pure spring water and it's it's a marketable thing, and the state of Oregon is able to sell the water rights and get some some money from. But you know, I think. I mean, I, I mean. You know, I, I understand the concern of privatization of water, but I don't really look at that as privatization of water. Sure, it's it's kind of you know, call water a commodity is a weird thing, but it's kind of this little commodity that they're they're, they're buying. If they if it were Nestle that were going to you know deliver the water to you know, take by eWeb and be the the water provider for you know community, it's not like people you know who can't afford this bottle of water are not going to you know. That that's where they're getting their water from, anyway. Right. Thank you. You're welcome.